Tonight, as, as we continue on looking from last week on keep the fire burning in our life and the symbolism that we had from in the Old Testament where Moses was commanded by God that in the tent of meeting that there was to be a, a candle stand there and it was to have a continual flame on it that they were never to let the flame go out. And it was the responsibility of the individual's the children of Israel, to bring in the fuel, to keep that fire burning. It was a command of God and symbolic of what He wants to do in our lives today, in, the, in our lives as we, as the church, have this amazing presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I, in simplicity, I'll just say this. God doesn't want us to just have a one-time experience with Him. God doesn't want us to just experience Him at camp. God doesn't want us to just experience Him uh, during uh, a time in, in church. He wants a, a continual flame of the Holy Spirit to be burning in every one of our lives. That's His desire. And so then it comes down to our responsibility for us to make sure that we are uh, uh, keeping that fueled on the inside of us, those desires and putting ourselves in a place where the Holy Spirit can continue to work in us and through us. So we looked at several scriptures last week. We looked where in Matthew chapter 3 where uh, John said, I baptize you with water, but one's coming after me that's not, that I'm not worthy even to, uh, to, 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 to touch and to wash his feet, basically. Um, but he's saying, there's one that's coming, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Could you just say fire tonight? It is God's desire for the fire, the cleansing fire, the purifying work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So many Christians struggle with guilt and condemnation because of failures in their life because they they yielded to a temptation in their life i said i would never do that again i promised god i would never do that again and i did it and they sense that guilt and condemnation in it, and it kind of pushes them away from the presence and the intimacy that god wants the power of the holy spirit coming into our lives part of his work is he wants to help burn up the chaff the worthless stuff in our lives and to refine us. And so we're not constantly living in a guilt syndrome, but we're, we are giving glory to God in the way that we can overcome temptation in our life. Amen? Amen? Sometimes we just need to tell someone, turn to someone and tell them, you can say no. You can say no. It's so important for us to understand well, and we're looking a few moments here. The wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit helps us that it's more than just willpower, but it's Holy Spirit power that helps us to grow along. We won't turn to it, but last week we mentioned in 2 Timothy where Paul is telling Timothy to, to do these things so that you can be prepared as a useful temp, uh, utensil or someone that's prepared for the work of the Lord in our life. God wants to use us, but we need to be usable. And the Holy Spirit helps to equip us and to prepare us to be used of the Lord in our lives. So we want to talk about keeping the fire burning in our life, the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the effects of the Holy Spirit, the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But before that, I want to stop for just a moment. And just like in the natural, there are things that will ex extinguish a fire. What's some things that will extinguish a fire other than a fire extinguisher? Water, dirt, baking soda, what? Lack of air. I thought she said a black bear. I said, I don't know how that works out, but I guess black, anyone, anything else? Lack of air. Yep. If you could blow it out in extents, yeah. So good illustration. Thanks for messing up my message with that one, but that's all right, but that's, that's a good one, that's a good one. Yeah, so those are, those are things that can extinguish or can hamper a fire. And just like there's things that in the natural that can extinguish or hamper a fire, I want to just real quickly, I just sense I want to, we get this into us, I'm not going to go in real depth, just real quickly. There are some things in our spiritual life that if we're not careful, we allow to come into our life that will quench the Holy Spirit. Ken, I don't know what it is, but there seems to be a little extra echo tonight, if you can adjust that, or, or go get 100 people to sit in the back or something, I don't know, but uh, so there's some things. Number one, here's the one, and I, I would say this is probably number one, don't be offended. Offense 
is probably the number one thing that will quench the fire of the Holy Spirit in our life. More people leave church because they get offended probably than any other reason. There's, and, and, and we have to be careful. I mean, even in the ministry of Jesus, when he was preaching the word and really was preaching on commitment and preaching on this is what we need to get ready to do, it says that many of his disciples left him from that point. They got offended at the word that he was preaching to them. And so it's not my responsibility to just preach messages that are fluffy. It's our responsibility to make sure that we are not offended along with take no offense. Offense is a trap that the enemy will use to try to pull us away from the presence of God and the presence of his people. And so it's important for us, don't be offended. Amen? The second thing that I would say that, that, that oftentimes uh, tampers the fire in people's lives is disappointment. We've all prayed for healing or we prayed for guidance or we prayed for this situation and it didn't work. And we get disappointed. And if we're not careful, disappointment slips into discouragement. And so what, what's the use? Why even go to church? Why even pray? Why even read your Bible? And see what is happening is the disappointment has put your fire out in your life. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow those disappointments to go along. Remember the disciples after Jesus was crucified? The plan of God was being accomplished. The Savior of the world was paying for the sins of humanity. But they were disappointed because it wasn't working out the way they thought it was. Earlier that week, they'd all been uh, arguing about who gets to sit on which side of him when he goes into the kingdom of God because they thought this thing was really going to, to become a, a national movement and they were going to have great positions of authority. But, but they were disappointed because things didn't work out the way they thought it was going to work out. So they, they went fishing. They, they reverted back into their old ways that they felt comfortable with, their natural world around them. I just want to encourage you, even if things don't work, has, maybe I'm the only one that has prayed and it didn't work. I don't know, but... Don't become discouraged, and especially don't allow disappointments to go into discouragement. Number two, discouragement or disappointment. Don't become disappointed. Number three, here's one that seems right and oftentimes really works on people and pulls them away from the presence of God and His fire, and that's busyness. Is anybody busy? Anybody got, you know? I, I, I talk to retired people, and they're like, I, can't, I, I couldn't go back to work if I wanted to. Now I'm too busy. You know, there's, there's, a, there's always a busyness. And in this world, if we're not careful, there's a busyness that starts to get into our life. We start to, to constantly be trying to do more, stay up later, get up earlier, get more accomplished. And even in the ministry, if we're not careful, we're just constantly got more and more and more. And we think if we do more, that we're more valuable. Instead of remembering, God says that we're supposed to take a rest. Take a break, be refreshed, slow down, and make sure that we're not allowing the busyness of life to control us. We make sure that we're in control of, of our life. If you're too busy, I, I'm, I hesitate to even say it because I don't want this to come across as any kind of criticism. It's more of a concern. People say, I'm just too busy to go to church. I, I, under, I honestly understand what they're saying, but my heart breaks because I know that the busyness of their lifestyle has started to control them. I, I know I should pray more, but I'm too busy. We're too busy to spend intimate time with God. Too busy. And so I just want to encourage you, if we're going to maintain a fire of God in our life and in our church, we have to make sure that busyness doesn't start to control us. And the last one that we just want to just mention this, the, this evening and, and ones that you, it's very obvious, and that's materialism. If things have a hold of you instead of you have a hold of them, um, it will take the, the fire of God out of your life. Materialism, we should all have a, a generous nature about us because God has been so generous to us. He has blessed us with his grace. He has blessed us with salvation. He has... Here it is. He's blessed us with his presence. Such a generous God that he is. 
don't ever, don't ever hold so tight onto materialistic things that we don't have room in our life to hold on to the presence of drop those things and hold on to the presence of God. Get a hold of Him. So materialism oftentimes will drag us away and drain the fire of God in our lives. All right, those are the negative things. You guys don't need it. Those are notes for other people that I'm sure you'll be able to minister to. But, but, but get a hold of that because this is, this is why I shared those. We can constantly fuel a fire, but if we are constantly pouring water, flour, dirt, and blowing on it, then, then it's going to keep going out. And we're going to say, what's wrong with me? How come I don't have the fire of God in my life? As we pour a little bit more water on it, put a little more dirt on it, a little more baking soda on it. Why don't I have the fire of God? This is the other side. Of it. If we stop doing those things, it's amazing just how much that fire will grow. It doesn't take a lot to keep it going in our lives. So let's look real quickly this evening about a Three things that we can do. I guess it just worked out that way that we had four and three here. It's not a big number thing here. But how to keep the fire of God in our lives. This is your responsibility. I want you to understand. Or maybe I should say it this way. This is yours and my privilege to be able to maintain the fire of God in our lives. Stop for just a moment before we're going along and think of it, folks. You don't have to be just born in a certain generation. You don't have to be just someone who is called to a particular ministry or a particular um, certain individual to be able to have the fire of God in your life. Every single one of us have as much of the fire of God in our life as we want. You might write that one down. Every single one of us have as much of the fire of God in our lives as we want. It's up to us because that fire needs to be taken care of, valued, fueled, and as we do so, it will continue to grow in our lives. So, here it is. Here it is. How to keep that fire burning in our lives personally. Number one, this is the most important. Value the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Value. The Holy Spirit is not just an it. The Holy Spirit is not just a dove that we put on some windows or something like that. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God in our life. Isn't that incredible? Holy Spirit, His presence in our lives, that He wants to be with us. He wants to be present with us. And that we need to make sure that we are taking the time to just simply value the Holy Spirit. Repeat this after me. I need the Holy Spirit. You know how we really should be saying that? I need the Holy Spirit. I, I, I need the Holy Spirit. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to face a day without the Holy Spirit in my life. I, I don't want to face problems with the, without the Holy Spirit. I certainly don't want to face you without the Holy Spirit in my life. I don't want to face demonic influence without the Holy Spirit. I don't want to face my flesh in the mirror without the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. We need the Holy Spirit. And I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit is not some some vague thing that we're trying to get out here, but he's, he's, I am God, he says, and I will be with you, and I'm going to be in you, and I'm going to be on you, and I'm going to empower you. I'm going to, I'm going to be like a fire that consumes you in your life. And so I just want to encourage us, number one tonight, to just remind ourselves how valuable it is to have the Holy Spirit in our lives. What a blessing. We need the Holy Spirit. Each one of us have flesh and we need the holy spirit in our lives to be able to help us to say no to the temptations of our flesh as i said earlier you need more than and i need more than willpower we need holy spirit power in our lives why is that because my will is a deceptive thing i'll just let be real honest with you dennis likes to deceive himself I like to justify what I want. I like to, my flesh, if it wants it, I can figure out a way why it's okay for me to have it. That's why so many preachers wind up in sin is because we've justified it. Instead of being empowered by the Holy Spirit and say, that's not worth it when I have the valuable presence of God in my life. His presence 
His presence is worth so much more than that moment, that, 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 that temporal situation, that, that temporary uh, 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 relief or excitement in my life. I value the presence of the Holy Spirit so much more. I need the Holy Spirit in my life. I'm a mess without the Holy Ghost. I, 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 I'm struggling with, but I would just be a mess without the Holy Spirit in my life. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. You want to thank God I got the Holy Ghost in my life. I need the Holy Spirit, and I value the presence of the Holy Spirit because I have to face demonic attacks. There is a demonic world there. There is an evil world that comes against us, against all of us, and, and doesn't wait when, when we're the most strong and built up. He waits so we're the weakest. He's waiting in those lonely moments of temptation. He, he comes at us and lays traps. He, he lures us. These are all terms of deception, and that's why we need the super, supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to go against the supernatural power of the devil. Satan and his kingdom is supernatural it's not flesh and blood Paul says we're not fighting against flesh and blood but against spirits spiritual world and so we need the spirit of the Holy Spirit and and he's not equal to the devil the Holy Spirit is far greater than the devil greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and so I value the Holy Spirit in my life, and I want to keep that flame burning in my life so that I can quench every fiery dart that the devil throws at me. You will be attacked by the devil. Don't be surprised, the scripture says, when these things happen. Too many Christians are like surprised when the devil attacks them. We shouldn't be surprised. We just need to be ready. How do you get ready for an attack of the devil? Just value the presence of the Holy Spirit. Stay filled with your presence of the Holy Spirit. Trust in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You in and of yourself cannot defeat the devil, but greater is he that is in you, with you, over you, around you, and he will protect you, and he will put you over in your life. Amen? So uh, we need to value the Holy Spirit because he's the only way we can overcome the, the kingdom of darkness. We need to value the Holy Spirit because we cannot do the work of God without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Reinhard Bonnke said, doing evangelism without the Holy Spirit is like trying to have a fire without heat. You can't do it. We have to have the Holy Spirit in our life to do the work of evangelism, to really reach to this world that is around us, to reach into those that are in the kingdom of darkness, you understand. We're not just trying to get people to like us and come to Grandview and stick around for a while. We are actually reaching, going up to the spiritual gates of hell. We knock those gates down and we reach in there and we reach into people's lives and we pull them out of spiritual darkness by the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and we uh, encourage them to come over and to be transformed in the kingdom of God's love. Do you think the devil's going to like that? No. Do you think your flesh can do that? No. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to do that. Isn't it interesting that Jesus told the disciples, those people that had seen him do the miracles, those people that had seen him raise the dead, those people that had seen him raised from the dead, he told them in Acts chapter 1 there, he said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but don't leave town until you have the Holy Spirit. Don't, you know, if we'd say today, don't try this at home without the Holy Spirit in your life. Now right there, if that's the words of the resurrected Lord Jesus, then I should value the presence and the purpose of the Holy Spirit in my life. If I'm going to do what Jesus has called me to do, then I have to have the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. Too. So I need to keep the fire burning. How do I do that? Uh, by valuing His presence. We, we, we made reference to it there, Acts chapter 1 and Verses 4 through 8, that's where Jesus is talking to them. So don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the power, the presence, the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit that the Father has promised to you. Because after you have received the power of the Holy Spirit, then you can be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Some people see that as, well, this is a process of, of, of progression of where they're supposed to travel to. I take it also in this way. There's nowhere you can't go that the Holy Spirit can't help you to be the witness you need to be. 
There's nowhere that you can't go. I know my English sentence isn't constructed in a way that it needs to be, but it's summertime and we forget some of those, those things. But, but you, there's nowhere that you can't go that the power of the Holy Spirit can't cause you to be a witness because it's not about you. It's the valuing the one who's, that you're carrying, his presence in your life. The gift of the Holy Spirit empowers us to be a witness, strengthens us for spiritual power and to pray, and gives us the supernatural ability to follow after him and know the plan of God for our lives. We need to make sure we never lose not just an awareness of his presence, but the value, the value of the presence of the Holy Spirit. I know we're running out of time here real quickly tonight, but I was just thinking of today earlier... Remember the story in the Old Testament, true story in the Old Testament, Jacob's Ladder. Remember, Jacob was, was a, a, one of the great patriarchs in the Old Testament. And he's going along and he's traveling um, and traveling to Bethel, I think it was. He's traveling along and all of a sudden, you know, at that, in the way they did it then, they did a lot of camping. And so it was nighttime and he, he lays down, puts his head on a rock. I don't know how you can put your head on a rock and sleep, but he was, he was doing that and he, he went to sleep. And in that night, he had a divine dream or vision by God gave him at night. And there was a stairway that was opened up to heaven. And there was angels that were coming back and forth from that stairway. And then at the top of the stairway was God himself. And he spoke a promise to Jacob. And he declared to Jacob what his will is for Jacob's life here on this earth. And when Jacob wakes up, listen to this verse in, in, in Genesis 28, verses 16 and 17. Listen, when Jacob wakes up, after having this incredible experience, here in the middle of nowhere, he says this, Then jo Jacob awa awakened from the sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. Stop for a minute. How often do we go through our day? God's right there with us, and we're not even aware of it. It shouldn't have to be a supernatural manifestation of angels and visions for us to be aware of the presence of God in our life. He wakes up and he says, surely the presence of the Lord is here. And I was not even aware of it. Verse 17 says, but he was also afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. Oh, side thought here. I think we ought to act that way when we come to church. This is the very house of God. Does that change things from just, let's go hang out at church for a while? This is the very house of God. In one sense, the gateway to heaven. This is how people get, get to heaven. It's not, not coming to church per se, but when the church reaches and impacts their, impacts their life, with the things of God and heaven, heaven reveals the will and everybody that, that is, is created, God has a purpose for their life. God has a plan for their life. And, and oftentimes when we get together, God starts to speak to us and starts to reveal his will and his purpose to us. Folks, when we get together as a church, it ought to be times where people come in here and they're, and I didn't even realize it, but the presence of God is here. This is an amazing place. Just Sunday, one of our first time visitors came and he said, when I walked in the door, I sensed the presence of God was here. Another individual I just went and visited this week said that Dr. Mike had, had, had spent some time praying for him. He, he'd had a toe amputated. And, the, and because of his, his illness, the, the doctors had said, you know, it's not going to heal up very quickly at all. You're going to have a lot of struggles here. He said, Dr. Mike came and he kind of massaged my foot, started praying over it and told me I needed to talk to it. And he said, my toe healed up. It wasn't supposed to. But it did. What an awesome thing. The presence of God. Jacob was, was, was just almost dumbfounded. He said, the presence of God is here and I didn't realize it. I want you to know that most of you were in every one of those services I just talked about. We don't always sense the presence of God. And yet, sometimes I think it's because of that busyness. Or because we get distracted or we just haven't stopped just become aware of the presence of the Lord in our life. Do we value God's presence? Phil Johnson said, made the statement one time, and it's not left me. He said, I never want people to come to church expecting to experience God, and all they get is me. I want to make sure that people, 
I don't care if I fumble through a message. I don't care if I uh, use my pronouns in a wrong way. I don't, I, I don't care if I, if I mispronounce my words. If you experience God, that's all that really matters. The people experience him. So this is individually, but we as a congregation, we must have a value and expectation of the Holy Spirit too. If we want in our services a continual move of God and the presence of God to transform our lives. Number two, real quickly, number two, we need to make sure that we feed the fire. Feed the fire. Don't wait for a feeling. You've got to keep feeding the fire. Oftentimes we wait till, oh, I'm getting cold, so I need to go put some wood on the fire. What we should do is we should constantly be tending the fire. We're constantly feeding the fire. We're constantly being aware of the presence of, of what needs to go on. Uh, in a natural sense, any fire needs fuel continually. And you as a believer and I as a believer, if we want to stay on fire for God, we have to continually to feed ourselves. In Proverbs 26, 20, the, the Benton Semtuatit um, translation says, with much wood, fire increases. You wouldn't think you'd have to go to the Bible to look at that, but, but it's a good reminder for us. It's an illustration. If you've got a lot of wood, then the fire will increase. Now, in this situation, it's talking about uh, those that, that are, are, are continuing gossiping, that their strife will increase. If there's a lot of gossip, then strife will increase. Stop gossiping, and strife naturally goes out. Well, if that works in the negative, it works in the positive also. If we keep stirring up thanksgiving, if we keep stirring up valuing the presence of God, if we keep stirring up our faith, stirring up our expectation, if we keep fueling that with, with, in our lives, that's the fire that will continue to grow in our lives. And as a church, we have to do it as, 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 a, as a whole, not just in me, but in us. 2 Corinthians 4.16, the Amplified says, Therefore, we do not become discouraged, spiritless, disappointed, or afraid, though our outward self is progressively wasting away. Our outward self is progressively wasting away. I'm getting older. I'm getting brown spots on spots in my face. This is getting darker. This is getting lighter. This is getting thicker. This is getting thinner. These things happen in life. That's my outward man. But you can't see on the inside of me. On the inside, I get newer every day. My spirit's not getting an old man that can't hardly get around. I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. And I'm growing progressively on the inside. That's the spirit on the inside. How, how, it doesn't matter how big the flesh is. What matters is how big the spirit is on the inside. And Paul says, my outward man may be decaying, but my inward man, the spirit, that's what he calls the spirit on the inside, is being renewed day by day. How does that happen? Is it just happen just because? No, because Paul knew how he had to keep fueling that fire on the inside. He knew he had to keep rejoicing in the Lord always and again rejoicing. He knew that he had to w give thanks always in all situations. He knew that he had to let the word of God dwell richly on the inside of him. He knew that he had to be filled or be being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to himself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in his heart. He knew these things. Jude 20, building up yourself on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. These are things that we must do to fuel the fire on the inside of us. It's wonderful to go somewhere and have someone with a hot hand touch you on the head. But it's a greater thing is to get your spirit burning on the inside of you. And fueled up. And being then a part of a church that's fueled up. Prayer and worship helps every single one of us to keep that fire growing and going. You can just write this scripture down and look it up later there in 2 Corinthians 4.16 where the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And he says, again out of the Amplified, therefore we do not become discouraged. As we said, he's building up that inner man. And then verse, excuse me, 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15, the Amplified says, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. But my mind is unproductive because it doesn't understand what my spirit is praying. Therefore, he says, then what will I do? 
I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the, with the understanding. I will pray with the Holy Spirit through my spirit, and I will pray with my mind or, or understanding words. I will sing with the Spirit or the Holy Spirit within me, and I will sing with my mind and my understanding also. He's saying, I will. Could you repeat that after me? I will. 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 You have a will. I just wish I was more on fire for God, Pastor. You got a will. I just wish the devil would leave me alone. Well, you can't make the devil leave you alone, but you can make him wish he'd leave you alone. I will. The will that stirred on the inside of us, Paul saying to the church at Corinth, these are things that we individually, I must do. I must sing. I must pray. I'm, I've got to do these things. I've got to do it with my mind. There's things that I can sing and pray about with my mind, scriptures that I know, and then the Holy Spirit within me prays those things out with that heavenly language that's been given to us, empowering us. So valuing the gift of the Holy Spirit, fueling the flame in our lives, and the last one that would be would be just spend time with others that are on fire. Have you ever gone to the break room where everybody is yin and yin and yin yin? You just feel like you've just walked through the barnyard, you know? It just, just, it just, the, there's a weight that's even in that room. There's a, there's just, it makes you just, it just if you're not careful, it gets in you and you start thinking, complaining and, 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 griping and, and there, nothing's going good and, and man, they're, they're wanting us to, to work, work at our job. They're wanting us to work. Can you imagine that? They want us to work, you know, and stuff like that going on there. And, but we've got to spend time together with other believers that are on fire for God. Find other believers that are on fire. Make the time to spend time with other believers that are on fire for God. Get around them, encouraging one another, strengthening one another. It was on the day of Pentecost, fully came when all the believers together and the Holy Spirit was, uh, was poured upon all of them. But they'd been there waiting, hungering, desiring, praying, praying, and then the Holy Spirit moved on their lives. It's spending that time. If we went over to, to Hebrews chapter 10, it tells us, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as some do. Have, and, and encourage one another as you come together. Folks, I want to encourage you that as we not just have church services, but we are the church and we come together, that we spread the fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives, spending time together. Recently, I, I heard an individual say that, you know, years ago they used to say love is spelled T-I-M-E. Anybody heard that before? Love is spelled T-I-M-E. But they said, now with all the electronic devices that everybody has, you can be together, but you're not together. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, we were down in, 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 uh, on vacation there at Charleston, and we were going across, taking a water taxi across, and here we are in one of the most historical places in our nation, and incredible things that went on there, and all the history and the beauty that was around, just the, the beauty of the ocean and stuff that was there. We're going across, and here's a, a young family, husband, wife, and a child, and all three of them was on their phone doing something. It's like, why didn't you just stay home? But, but they, they were there, but they weren't there. But they say this today, love is when you show attention to somebody. How many times we've heard people say, They're, those kids are acting out. You know, you know, all they want is some attention. That's right. And nobody's giving it to them. And they're crying out for it in some way. Somebody, show me some attention. Jokingly, my dad always used to say that, Dennis, you need some attention. And, and in some ways, part of me is like, no, but, but he noticed me. I was the youngest of four, and Dad was busy, tired. But he noticed me. You know what? We need to notice one another. We need to pay attention to one another. We shouldn't come to church saying, I want some attention. We should come full of the Holy Spirit saying, who needs some attention? Why, why, why is it that, that Paul is not popping around here like she normally is, saying, hola, hola, hola. 
Why, 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 why is that? I, I need to show her some attention. What in the world is, is, is Timon sitting on the left side of the church instead of the right side of the church? Something's going on there. I need to show them some attention. And in some ways, by me just saying, Jackie, what are you doing sitting over here? What I've done is I let her know that I noticed. I cared enough to notice. I'll be honest, I, I struggle with names, but I try to at least remember something about the person and talk to them. But how much more we need to realize that it's not just a natural thing, you do these things and people will come back to grant you. It's when we, when we have an attention with the Holy Spirit, because that's when the gifts start to flow. We start to really notice where maybe Mary's got a smile on her face, but all they say, Mary... Something just doesn't seem right. What's going on? And we give some attention. What does that do? It fuels the fire of the Holy Spirit to move, not just on me, but on us, in us. Where we, where we don't try to catch kids doing something wrong, but we try to catch them doing something right. And we tell them about it. Man, thanks for being here. Thanks for being here early and being over at the school and getting things set up right. And thanks for, for what do we do? What, this is not just simple stuff. This is empowered by the Holy Spirit in our lives, folks. This is how we keep the fire burning. Because otherwise, church becomes all about me instead of what the Holy Spirit wants to do through me. It's not about, it, it, it's, it's not about me coming to church so God gives me a word as much as God, give me a word for somebody else. And it doesn't have to be some mysterious thing, just a word of encouragement, a word of exhortation, a word of comfort to somebody. I just show someone else attention, and in doing that, I'm showing them I love them. And love is how the gifts really work together. Because we can't have the fire of the Holy Spirit without love, or it's worthless along the way. So value the presence of the Holy Spirit. Fuel that gift in your life. Pray much, sing much, fuel that thing in you, not that, excuse me, that, 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 that hunger on the inside of you, that passion on the inside of you. And then make sure that, that we are, are being usable by the Holy Spirit as we're reaching out to other people that are, are around us, that, that we allow that presence that's in us and empowering us and and flowing through us, that we're spending time with other people that are on fire. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't go out into the world. We need to do that. But you'll look over and over through the, the, the book Acts. They would go out and they would evangelize, and then they would come into their own company. Remember, they were let out of prison, and they went into their own company, and they prayed, God, Creator, you know, and the long prayer there that they gave, and then, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness that we'd speak forth your word, you'd stretch forth your hand to heal, and the signs and wonders would be done in the name of the holy child Jesus. And as they prayed, the whole place was shaken, and they were all filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. Interesting. Went out there, did what they were supposed to do, got back together, got refired, and got ready to go right back out again. The importance of us Spending time with people that are on fire for God. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your presence. And Lord, if there is in any area of our life that we're not valuing you, Lord, if we, we're just going through life oh, unaware of your presence, we ask for you just a, a, a move of mercy and grace to shake us, Lord. Awaken us like you did Jacob. Remind us that you have a purpose for us here on this earth to fulfill your will here on this earth. Father, we just thank you for, again, the, the Holy Spirit, the great teacher, that you are filling us and reminding us of ways to keep that fire fueled in our lives, and that you're bringing scripture back to our remembrance on how to act it out and, and to, to be a doer of that word in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for Grandview. Lord, we ask for your, your, just your a continual divine blessing on this place. We want this to be your house. We want this to be heaven's gate. We want this to be a place where your fire is consuming us, where, 
where we come in from the, the struggles of the world around us and we are refreshed and refri- refined and refueled and then we go back out into that world on fire for God. After every time we get together, there's a refreshing of your presence in our lives. This is a place where the gifts of the Spirit move freely and people's lives are transformed and changed. And the supernatural takes place so that that fire continues to flow and grow and build greater and greater so that we can reach our communities for your glory. And that the, 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 the communities around us will know this is a house, this is a church that's on fire with God. That we're not known for our worship, we're not known for our building, we're known for your presence that is active in this place for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.